nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. The source of all our mistakes is fear. Out of fear, great nations have been acting like cornered beasts, thinking only of survival. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. For most Americans, 9-11 was a terrible tragedy. For George Bush and Dick Cheney, it was that plus more. A chance to implement the agenda that their neoconservative allies had been working up for decades. The project for the New American Century's recent report called Rebuilding America's Defenses had said the process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Al-Qaeda, in their mind, had given us Pearl Harbor. And within minutes of the attack, the Bush team leapt into action. With Bush in Florida, Vice President Cheney and his legal counsel, David Addington, took charge, arguing that the president, as a wartime commander-in-chief, could act virtually unfettered by legal constraints. On September 12th, already looking past al-Qaeda's Osama bin Laden group in Afghanistan, Bush, back in Washington, instructed counterterrorism chief Richard Clark See if Saddam did this. See if he's linked in any way. Well, it was Iraq, Saddam, find out, get back to me. And the reaction you got that day from the defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, from his assistant, Paul Wolfowitz. Well, Donald Rumsfeld said, uh, when we talked about bombing the Al-Qaeda infrastructure in Afghanistan, he said there were no good targets in Afghanistan. Let's bomb Iraq. And we said, but Iraq had nothing to do with this. And that didn't seem to make much difference. Donald Rumsfeld had already, on September 11, ordered strike plans for Iraq. Go massive, he said. Sweep it all up, things related and not. Within a matter of days, Bush announced before a joint session of Congress that the United States was embarking on a global war. From this day forward, any nation that continues to harbor or support terrorism will be regarded by the United States as a hostile regime. At home, 1,200 men were quickly arrested and detained. Another 8,000 sought for interrogation, mostly Muslims. Bush rushed a 362-page USA Patriot Act through Congress. Senators had no time to read the bill, let alone debate it. Only Senator Russ Feingold of Wisconsin voted against it, insisting, Preserving our freedom is one of the main reasons that we are now engaged in this new war on terrorism. We will lose that war without firing a shot if we sacrifice the liberties of the American people. Bush cloaked White House deliberations in an unprecedented veil of secrecy and in 2002 empowered the National Security Agency to conduct warrantless wiretaps and monitor U.S. citizens' emails on a massive scale. As in ears in every room. In violation of legal reviews required by legislation passed in 1978 in reaction to intelligence abuses of the previous decades. The administration barraged the public with constant alerts, heightened security, and a five-tier system of color-coded warnings. The system was at times being politically manipulated by Rumsfeld and Attorney General John Ashcroft. And in 2005, Tom Ridge, under pressure, felt compelled to resign. Potential terror targets jumped from 160 sites in 2003 to over 300,000 in the next four years. Amazingly, Indiana led all states with 8,600 potential targets by 2006. The national database included petting zoos, donut shops, popcorn stands, ice cream parlors, and the Mule Day Parade in Columbia, Tennessee. The unreality of the time continued to heighten. At the start of World War II, Franklin Roosevelt warned, War costs money. That means taxes and bonds and bonds and taxes. It means cutting luxuries and other non-essentials. 
Bush instead cut taxes on the wealthy and told Americans, Fly and enjoy America's great uh, destination spots. Take your families and enjoy life. Ironically, it was arch Cold Warrior Zbigniew Brzezinski who, in 2007, decried Bush's five years of almost continuous national brainwashing. Where is the U.S. leader ready to say, enough of this hysteria, stop this paranoia? Even in the face of future terrorist attacks, the likelihood of which cannot be denied, let us show some sense. Let us be true to our traditions. Terrorism, he stressed repeatedly, was a tactic, not an ideology, and declaring war on a tactic made absolutely no sense. We must stop the terror. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. But the real weight of Bush's global crusade would be felt abroad. Less than a month after the terrorist attacks, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, ostensibly to destroy some of the same Islamic fanatics the U.S. had helped arm and train to defeat the Soviets two decades earlier. Critics of the war would point out later that no Afghans were among the 19 9-11 hijackers, 15 of whom were Saudi, and that U.S. bungling allowed Osama bin Laden and other al-Qaeda leaders to escape into Pakistan in early December. The CIA did round up thousands of suspects in Afghanistan and beyond. Although the U.S. had always considered its humane treatment of prisoners of war a sign of its moral superiority, the Bush administration branded detainees as unlawful enemy combatants, waived the battlefield hearings required, and placed them outside the conventions of treatment mandated by the Geneva Convention of 1949. When foreign governments criticized his position, Bush backed down on the Taliban suspects but refused to change his policy for the al-Qaeda fighters. Bush said, I don't care what the international lawyers say. We're going to kick some ass. The U.S. flew an unknown number of detainees to secret black sites around the world in such places as Thailand, Poland, Romania, and Morocco, where torture and other harsh interrogation techniques were implemented. Hundreds of others were imprisoned at the U.S. naval station at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. At its peak in May 2003, the prison held roughly 680 men aged 13 to 98. Five percent of these were captured by U.S. troops. More than 80 percent were turned over, often for cash rewards by a combination of Afghan warlord militias and both Afghan and Pakistani bounty hunters. Government sources showed that only 8% were al-Qaeda fighters. 600 have been released, 6 convicted, and according to the government, 9 have died, most from suicide. As of 2012, 166 men from more than 20 countries remain in Guantanamo. The Bush administration encouraged the CIA to employ 10 enhanced interrogation methods that were the product of decades of research into torture, honed by allies in foreign countries. In February 2004, Major General Antonio Tuguba reported that his investigation had turned up numerous instances of sadistic, blatant, and wanton criminal abuses at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. There is no longer any doubt as to whether the current administration has committed war crimes. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., a former Kennedy aide, said this torture policy was the most dramatic, sustained, and radical challenge to the rule of law in American history. No position taken has done more damage to the American reputation in the world, ever. Although the security situation in Afghanistan worsened over the next seven years and the U.S. presence grew from 2,500 to 30,000 troops, Afghanistan was a distraction to Bush. His attention was focused on toppling his father's old adversary, Saddam Hussein. Evidence from intelligence sources, secret communications, and statements by people now in custody reveal that Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of Al-Qaeda. 
As had Bill Casey in the 1980s and Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam, Bush used false intelligence. Uh, there's no question that the leader of Iraq is an evil man. After all, he gassed his own people. We know he's been developing weapons of mass destruction. UN inspectors searched high and low, visiting sites identified by the CIA. They found nothing, but Bush insisted the WMD were there. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Bush told Bob Woodward of the Washington Post around this time. I do not need to explain why I say things. I don't feel like I owe anybody any explanations. These were extraordinary times. Words took on new meanings, fulfilling George Orwell's prophecies of doublespeak in his novel 1984. First they steal the words, then they steal the meaning. Words like axis of evil, war against terror, regime change, simulated drowning, preventive war. Civilians killed were now collateral damage. CIA kidnappings were now extraordinary renditions. And that most patriotic concept, the homeland, grew into a gargantuan new federal agency as labyrinthine as the Pentagon. The French philosopher Voltaire in the 18th century observed, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. The descent into unreality was dizzy. Black Hawk Down, another popular Oscar-nominated film appeared in late 2001, glorifying American heroism and technology in 1990s Somalia. Through technology, video games became more and more lifelike. And on television, increasingly bizarre and fanciful reality game shows prospered in the ratings. Jenna, the tribe has spoken. U.S. media beat the drums of war. MSNBC, which was owned by General Electric, canceled Phil Donahue's popular primetime show three weeks before the invasion. Officials feared that the show would provide a home for the liberal anti-war agenda. At the same time, our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity. And wave the flag they did. CNN, Fox, NBC paraded over 75 retired generals and officers, almost all of whom were later revealed to be working directly for military contractors. Pentagon officials gave them talking points, portraying Iraq as an urgent threat. Major newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, advanced the same message. One Bush insider told journalist Ron Suskind that Suskind represented the reality-based community. But that's not the way the world works anymore. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. When France, Germany, and Russia, as well as most of the Security Council, refused to support the U.S. position, Bush was furious and Rumsfeld sneered. You're thinking of Europe as Germany and France. I don't. I think that's old Europe. French fries in the congressional cafeteria were renamed Freedom Fries, just as sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage during World War I. Bush laid out his new strategy in a speech to the cadets at West Point in June 2002. We must take the battle to the enemy, disrupt his plans, and confront the worst threats before they emerge. The U.S. would act unilaterally and preemptively to overthrow any government deemed a threat to U.S. security. Cheney had declared, If there's a 1% chance Pakistani scientists are helping Al-Qaeda build or develop a nuclear weapon, we have to treat it as a certainty in terms of uh, our response. In the world we have entered, the only path to safety is the path of action, and this nation will act. Sixty countries made it onto Bush's potential hit list. With Bush calling for a moral crusade, saying that the United States must defend liberty and justice because these principles are right and true for all people everywhere. Moral truth is the same in every culture, in every time, 
and in every place. It was a bold statement of American exceptionalism. Bruce Bartlett, who served in both the Reagan and first Bush administrations, explained, This is why George W. Bush is so clear-eyed about Al-Qaeda and the Islamic fundamentalist enemy. He understands them because he's just like them. He truly believes he's on a mission from God. The whole thing about faith is to believe things for where there's no empirical evidence. I have a sense of calm knowing that the Bible's admonition, thy will be done, is life's guide. In early October 2002, Congress empowered Bush to go to war against Iraq on his own authority whenever he deemed it appropriate. Using whatever means, including nuclear weapons, he felt necessary. The resolution drew a direct connection between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Among those authorizing this were Senators John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. This would cost both of them dearly in their runs for president. Not all were fooled. Escalating this war and expanding this war does nothing in terms of our national security. It puts us more at risk. Iraq was not a haven for terrorists as it is now. Again, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and Al-Qaeda, there was no connection, and we have to dispel that notion so the American people know the truth. Millions of protesters hit the streets around the world. Three million in Rome, a million in London, hundreds of thousands in New York. Time magazine surveyed several hundred thousand Europeans. 84% thought the United States the greatest threat to peace. 8% thought Iraq was. Bush sent Secretary of State Colin Powell, the most respected member of his administration, before the United Nations to make a case for war. He told Powell, Maybe they'll believe you. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. Powell spoke for 75 minutes. It was a thoroughly shameful performance, promoting false intelligence that Powell later called a low point in his career. But the speech, although it fell flat overseas, had the desired impact on U.S. public opinion. Support for the war jumped from 50% to 63%. The Washington Post pronounced the evidence on WMD irrefutable. The U.S., without a Security Council resolution, was moving inexorably towards war. The truth was even darker. For Bush, Iraq was only the appetizer. After devouring Iraq, the neocons had their eyes set on the main course. Pentagon officials foresaw a five-year campaign with a total of seven targeted countries, beginning with Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and the biggest prize of all, Iran. It would be a war to remake the world, the neoconservative way. Talk of empire abounded. The New York Times Sunday Magazine cover for January 5, 2003 read, American Empire. Get used to it. Bush clearly was a man with a boldness of vision. He'd always exhibited an outlaw side as a younger man. Now he would outdo his towering father by going beyond the laws of nations. The eight-year war became the debacle critics predicted. Iraqi society was rent asunder. Like Vietnam, it warped America, polarizing it even further as costs and casualties mounted on all sides. Yet remarkably, Bush won the 2004 election with a naked appeal to even more fervent patriotism. By 2008, when Bush left office with the most dismal poll rating since Harry Truman, he had not only thoroughly mismanaged two wars, as well as the federal relief efforts for New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, but most importantly, in the eyes of the public, he mismanaged the economy of the country, which nearly collapsed in 2008 and ensured the presidency to the Democrats. His successor, Barack Hussein Obama, child of a black Kenyan father and a white Kansas mother who was raised in Indonesia and Hawaii, became at 47 president of the United States, evoking great hopes for change. His words and demeanor attested to the other side of America, constitutional, humanist, global, environmental. Obama had spoken out strongly against the Iraq war. What I do oppose is a dumb war. Financed by the Internet's multitude of small contributors, 
stun the heavily favored and financed Democratic Party choice Hillary Clinton in the primaries. He now confronted an ex-military man, conservative John McCain, in the national election. The wind was at Obama's back. Perhaps not since Roosevelt in the early 1930s was there such populist anger at Wall Street and the unnecessary wars of empire. But then an unexpected thing happened. Obama betrayed his earlier promise and became the first candidate to run in a general election to reject public financing in favor of private financing without limits. McCain, who took the public option, was badly outspent two to one. In this period, Obama turned quietly to Wall Street funders with deep pockets like J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Citigroup, as well as General Electric and other defense contractors, computer giants, and the pharmaceuticals industry, Big Pharma, which reversed years of supporting Republicans, giving Obama three times as much as McCain. Few of Obama's supporters complained at the time. His victory in the national election was applauded across the world. A new America was here. Though conservatives would absurdly decry Obama as a socialist, by far the biggest winner in the election turned out to be Wall Street. Obama brought back the same economic team that under Clinton had done so much to deregulate the economy. The New York Times referred to them as a constellation of Rubenites, acolytes of the most powerful Treasury Secretary in decades. Robert Rubin. After nearly wrecking the world economy with spectacular innovations in leveraging and speculation, several giant banks, insurance companies, and mortgage lenders prophesying the collapse of the world's economy if they went under, they were in other words too big to fail, eagerly accepted a $700 billion bailout on remarkably easy terms. In addition, the Federal Reserve Board cut the interest rate for banks to 0%. It became almost unpatriotic at the time to question the rightness of these financial rescues. But there were those who wondered, could not some of the sicker financial entities be let go and broken up? Could not these giants be confronted with the real market value of their toxic assets? The public wanted revenge. It was a classic Depression backroom moment, as illustrated by Frank Capra. You sit there back at your big cigars and think of deliberately killing an idea that's made millions of people a little bit happier. An idea that's brought thousands of them here from all over the country, by bus and by freight and jalopies and on foot, so they could pass on to each other their own simple little experiences. Why, look, I'm just a mug and I know it, but I'm beginning to understand a lot of things. Why, your type's as old as history. If you can't lay your dirty fingers on a decent idea and twist it and squeeze it and stuff it into your own pocket, you slap it down. Like dogs, if you can't eat something, you bury it. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker urged Obama to act. Right now, when you have your chance and the breasts are bared, you need to put a spear through the heart of all these guys on Wall Street that for years have been mostly debt merchants. But it didn't happen. The bailout was forced through a panicked Congress. The media applauded. The Treasury made no immediate demands that bankers make that money available in new loans to businesses or the public, or for that matter, cut their personal compensations. It made no demands that shareholders or bondholders absorb any losses. Taxpayers would fund the bailout alone. The biggest losers over time would be workers, pensioners, older people with savings, homeowners, small businessmen, students with loans, and those, especially African Americans, who lost their jobs to a surging structural unemployment problem. Many simply lost their tenuous grip on the proverbial American dream of joining the middle class. The myth of upward mobility was shattered. The bankers, or banksters as they were nicknamed during the Great Depression of the 1930s, had talked of voluntary restraint, but received
1,000 wounded, many of them severely. Iraqi death counts range from 150,000 to over a million. Two million Iraqis fled the country. The irony was exquisite. In deposing the Sunni Hussein, the United States had turned the new Shiite-dominated Iraq into a valuable ally of Iran, which ended up the war's biggest winner. Bush officials had estimated the Iraq war to cost 50 to 60 billion dollars. Rumsfeld had called anything above 100 billion baloney. By 2008, when Bush left office, the U.S. had spent some $700 billion on the war, not including long-term care for veterans. Economists project total long-term costs as high as $3 trillion. Obama welcomed the troops home at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, ensuring that the end of the war would be as dishonest as its beginning. But we're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq. Unlike the old empires. We don't make these sacrifices for territory or for resources. We do it because it's right. Never forget that you are part of an unbroken line of heroes spanning two centuries. To your grandparents and parents who faced down fascism and communism and delivered justice to those who attacked us on 9-11. Thus sanctioning once again Bush's lie about the connection of 9-11 to Iraq. The words were barely out of his mouth before Iraq was racked with a new series of deadly suicide bombings. To this day, Iraq teeters on the edge of civil war. Among the two wars' fiercest critics were the nation's mayors, who gathered in Baltimore in June 2011 and called for using $126 billion in savings from these wars to rebuild the nation's cities. The mayor of Los Angeles was quoted as saying, that we would build bridges in Baghdad and Kandahar and not Baltimore and Kansas City absolutely boggles the mind. For the American people, deadened to these wars, a single bright spot in this foreign miasma came in May 2011. A bold cross-border raid at night by Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden living comfortably in the shadow of Pakistan's premier military academy. In the euphoria the raid created in the U.S., celebrating the skill and power of the SEALs who had executed bin Laden vigilante style and dumped his body at sea, a new profile was created for Obama as, unlike Bush, an effective war president who would, by any means necessary, hunt down the enemy. In fact, really a wolf in sheep's clothing. After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden and took custody of his body. A celebrated movie even implied torture as effective in finding bin Laden. Though in fact it had been ordinary police and espionage work that located him after almost 10 years. Forgotten country. Geronimo was KIA. <laughs> Oh my Nonetheless, America's capacity for self-love was again in full flower, and there were no troubling discussions of bringing a wounded bin Laden back for imprisonment and trial, as the United States had done at Nuremberg, where the Nazi defendants were unmasked and diminished. But a trial was the last thing most Americans wanted. Those who accepted torture could tolerate vigilante justice. But who was the real victor here? After estimated trillions of dollars spent two wars, hundreds of thousands of dead worldwide, an endless war on terror, the loss of civil liberties and confidence in one presidency and the near collapse of the empire's financial structure along with it, it can be said by a neutral observer that at the least the U.S. had won a Pyrrhic victory in which its losses had made victory pointless. Bin Laden, with his twisted vision of a new caliphate, was dead, but had achieved far more than he ever dreamed. He goaded the largest, most powerful empire in history to reveal its worst nature. And like the Wizard of Oz, it didn't look so great and mighty. Who are you? 
Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Bin Laden's martyrdom in the eyes of his followers cemented his place in the history books as a catalyst who weakened and perhaps helped destroy the old world order. Some might call him the Hannibal or Attila of Roman myth, a Robespierre to the old French order, Lenin to Tsarist Russia, even a modern Hitler to the British Empire, which came to its end in his wake. Bin Laden was gone. But what would the United States do now? Still tormented by its demons, it turned its gaze fully to China as a new threat and persisted in treating Russia as an old one, as well as maintaining Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela as regional threats. Seeking to find a more efficient, leaner form of warfare, Obama in 2012 announced a 14% cut in future infantry strength to be compensated for by an increased emphasis in outer space and cyberspace. First used for surveillance in Vietnam, the drone, when equipped with missiles, was now becoming the modern face of warfare and Obama's weapon of choice. He personally began selecting those on the kill list. Prior to 9-11, the United States had opposed extrajudicial targeted killing by other nations condemning Israel's targeting of Palestinians. But by 2012, the Air Force and CIA were deploying a 7,000 drone armada, used mostly in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. Obama expanded its usage to Yemen in 2009, where there were fewer than 300 militants. By mid-2012, that number had increased to over 1,000 as a steady barrage of U.S. drone attacks outraged Yemeni citizens. By 2012, Obama added Gaddafi's Libyan supporters, Islamic rebels in the Philippines, and Somalia to the drone list. The repercussions of this style of warfare are yet to be experienced. The number of civilian casualties of these attacks are fiercely contested by the U.S. government and several human rights organizations. When the judge asked the Pakistani-born Times Square bomber, how he could risk killing innocent women and children, he replied that U.S. drones were regularly killing women and children in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The cat was certainly out of the bag, and by 2012, more than 50 countries, some friendly and some hostile to the U.S., had purchased drones. Israel, Russia, India, and Iran claimed to have mastered manufacturing lethal ones, but the most dynamic program was China's. As with the nuclear bomb, a new arms race was on. Bush had continued Clinton's expansion of NATO bases closer to Russia, breaking his father's promise to Gorbachev. Obama expanded NATO to Albania and Croatia, and despite abandoning 500 bases in Iraq, the Obama administration, in addition to an estimated 6,000 bases in the U.S., is maintaining close to 1,000 overseas bases that span the globe. The U.S. had, by late 2007, gained a military presence, according to Stanford's Chalmers Johnson, in 151 of 192 U.N. member nations. In 2008, AFRICOM, based in Germany, was added as a sixth command responsible for growing U.S. military presence in Africa. SOUTHCOM, based in Miami, was reorganized in 2010 to increase U.S. military presence in Latin America with bases and surveillance systems, counter-drug and counter-insurgency programs targeting manifestations of radical populism, as seen in Venezuela. The 4th Fleet was reactivated in 2008 for the first time since World War II. The Navy now has 10 carrier strike groups patrolling international waters. America's Navy, a global force for good. In 2011, the U.S. sold an astonishing 78% of the world's arms. During the Bush years, Pentagon spending more than doubled to $700 billion. 
Although the real Pentagon budget blurs into secret functions and different departments of government, by 2010, according to the National Priorities Project, the U.S. actually spends an estimated $1.2 trillion out of its $3 trillion annual budget on military, intelligence, and homeland security. A full-spectrum dominance of land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. In November 2011, Secretary of State Clinton threw down the gauntlet on China, writing, as the war in Iraq winds down and America begins to withdraw its forces from Afghanistan, the United States stands at a pivot point. Calling this America's Pacific Century, she meant a substantially increased military involvement in the Asia-Pacific region to contain China. Beginning with the Opium Wars in the 19th century, China has been humiliated time and again by stronger foes, Britain, Japan, Russia. It fought the U.S. to a standoff in Korea in the early 1950s. China is a proud nation, the world's second largest economy, a hybrid. Part state-owned, part capitalist, it has replaced the U.S. as Asia's main trading partner. But in 1996, Chinese leaders were humiliated again by U.S. nuclear missile rattling during another confrontation over Taiwan. And with its economic interests and shipping lanes to protect, it set out to modernize its military. In 2012, the Pentagon estimated Chinese expenditures of $160 billion. But given the secrecy of the Chinese system, the real budget is unknowable at this time. Although it has only one foreign base, its hard line over disputed oil, gas, and mineral-rich islands and territories in the East and South China Seas have escalated tensions with its regional neighbors. Internally, the government, communist in name only, remains politically backward, determined at any cost to modernize and brutally willing to stifle dissent where its one-party rule has been questioned. Western democracies, while doing business with China, have condemned these policies to little avail. But more ominously, China has again attracted the wrath of China-bashing American hardliners whose animosity dates back to the McCarthy era. A new face-off is in the works. The U.S. has returned to Asia, seeking new alliances, rebalancing its fleet, deploying its top stealth warplanes to bases within striking distance of China by 2017. It has strengthened military alliances with China's neighbors, particularly Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines, sending 2,500 Marines to Australia, the first long-term troop increase in Asia since Vietnam. The Chinese were deeply angry over the Obama administration's new arms sales of some $12 billion to Taiwan in 2010 and 11. They have accused the U.S. of seeking to encircle them. The fear of the U.S. by others cannot be underestimated. As the late conservative political scientist Samuel Huntington acknowledged in 1996. The West won the war not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion, but rather by its superiority in the application of organized violence. Westerners often forget this fact. Non-Westerners never do. Progressive China experts fear the U.S. is once again employing Truman's 1946 playbook with the Soviet Union in an attempt to contain China. The same situation exists once again with Western revulsion for China's internal policies. But this time, holding $1 trillion in U.S. Treasury bonds, the Chinese could imperil the U.S. economy in ways the Soviets never could. Historian Alfred McCoy delineated the real stakes when he wrote, As early as 2020, the Pentagon hopes to patrol the entire globe ceaselessly, relentlessly, via a triple canopy space shield, reaching from stratosphere to exosphere, driven by drones armed with agile missiles. The triple canopy should be able to blind an entire army by knocking out ground communications, avionics, and naval navigation. But as McCoy cautions, the illusion of technological invincibility and information omniscience 
has failed arrogant nations in the past, as the fate of Germany in World War II and the U.S. in Vietnam attest. With tragic irony, McCoy reminds us that the U.S.'s veto of global lethality might be an equalizer for any further loss of economic strength, and that the U.S.'s fate might well be determined by which comes first in this century-long cycle. Military debacle from the illusion of technological mastery, or a new technological regime powerful enough to perpetuate U.S. global dominion. But as a popular series of Star Wars movies shows, a nation dominating the world with its technology will soon become a tyranny. Rise, my friend that will be hated by those who are tyrannized. China may become the first new empire to emerge in this nuclear-armed world, but an empire modeled on the US or British versions would be a disaster. Great Han chauvinism would be no better than American exceptionalism. Former defense official Joseph Nye observed that the dominant power's failure to integrate the rising powers of Germany and Japan into the 20th century global system resulted in two catastrophic world wars. History must not be allowed to repeat itself again. The Chinese must shun the American example and the U.S. must reverse course. Henry Wallace worried that if the U.S. treated the Soviets so badly when the U.S. was riding high economically and militarily, how would the Soviets treat the U.S. when and if the situation was reversed? It never happened, but this race to the bottom, he understood, would have no winner. As we close out this series, we must ask ourselves humbly, in looking back at the American century, have we acted wisely and humanely in our relations to the rest of the world? A world in which the richest few hundred or a thousand or a couple thousand have more wealth than the poorest three billion? Have we been right to police the globe? Have we been a force for good, for understanding, for peace? We must look in the mirror. Have we perhaps in our self-love become the angels of our own despair? claims of victory in the Second World War and justification for the atomic bomb dropped on Japan, though aimed at the Soviet Union, were the founding myths of our domination and national security state, and the nation's elites have benefited from that. The bomb has allowed us to win by any means necessary, which makes us, because we win, right, and because we are right, we are therefore good. Under these conditions, there is no morality but our own. As Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said, but if we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. Because we can and have threatened humanity with a bomb, our mistakes are forgiven, and our cruelties justified as benignly motivated aberrations. But domination doesn't last. Five major empires have collapsed in the lifetime of a person born before World War II. Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. Three more empires earlier in the 20th century. The Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman. If history is a barometer, the United States domination will end as well. We wisely resisted becoming a colonial empire and most Americans would deny all imperial pretensions. Perhaps that is why we cling so doggedly to the myth of American exceptionalism. American uniqueness, benevolence, generosity. Maybe in that fanciful notion lies the seeds of American redemption. The hope that the United States will live up to that vision which seemed within grasp in 1944 when Wallace almost became president or 1953 when Stalin died with a new U.S. president in office, or JFK and Khrushchev in 1963, or Bush and Gorbachev in 89, or Obama in 2008. History has shown us the curve of the ball could have broken differently. These moments will come again in a different form. Will we be ready? 
I think back to Franklin Roosevelt on the last day of his life, cabling Churchill. I would minimize the Soviet problem as much as possible because these problems, in one form or another, seem to arise every day, and most of them straighten out. Calming down the situations that occur, letting things happen without overreacting, seeing the world through the eyes of our adversaries. This way lies in sharing in the needs of other countries with true empathy and compassion trusting a collective will of this planet to survive the coming period, ending the threats of nuclear annihilation and global warming. Can we not surrender our exceptionalism and our arrogance? Can we not cut out the talk of domination? Can we stop appealing to God to bless America over other nations? Hardliners and nationalists will object, but theirs has proven not to be the way. A young woman said to me in the 1970s, we need to feminize this planet. I thought it strange then, but now I realize there's power in love, real power in real love. Let us find a way back to respect the law, not of the jungle, but the law of civilization by which we first came together and put aside our differences to preserve the things that matter. Herodotus wrote in the 5th century before Christ, the first history was written in the hope of preserving from decay the remembrance of what men have been. And for that reason, the history of man is not only one of blood and death, but one also of honor, achievement, kindness, memory, and civilization. There is a way forward by remembering the past. And then we can start, step by step, like a baby, reaching for the stars. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal.